Thanks everyone for, for coming to this IACS seminar. Uh, we're very excited to have Emmanuel Candace. Emmanuel Candace is the Barnum Simons, Barnum Simons Chair in Mathematics and Statistics and Professor of Electrical Engineering by courtesy at Stanford University. Until 2009, Professor Candace was the Ronald and Maxine Lind Professor of Applied and Computational Mathematics at the California Institute of Technology. Professor Candace graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique in 1993 with a degree in science and engineering and received his PhD in statistics from Stanford and Stanford University in 1998. We're very lucky to have him and uh, take it away, Professor Candace. Um, thank you very much. I should say that one of the privilege of working at Stanford is to, uh, to have um, fabulous students uh, under our care. And uh, one of them is, is standing here, Lucas. And so uh, that's a great thing about being at a, at a fabulous institution like Harvard and Stanford is we get to work with the, with the brightest. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I thought I, sh I wish I could be with you in person, uh, but I think it's gonna be for soon because things, uh, at least in California, COVID-19 is receding. And so hopefully I'll be able to visit um, Harvard soon. And so today, what I wanna to talk to you about are some work in our group on reliable predictive inference um, we're going to try to touch on a lot of themes. I may not have time to get to all the whole lot of themes, all the themes. So in the end, it's possible that I take a poll to see uh, what you'd like me to cover and what you'd like me to omit. So uh, before I get started, I want to say that this is joint work with a bunch of people. Uh, primarily, uh, I'm going to spend some time discussing counterfactual inference, which is an important subject these days. And this is work with... Uh, a wonderful postdoc at Stanford uh, named Lee Wale. Okay, so um, to get started, I think, uh, you know, probably I don't need to convince you that machine learning is all the rage at the moment. And uh, in my lifetime, we've experienced a, a, a shift in the sense that, you know, when I started to pay attention to machine learning, the applications of machine learning were fairly benign, you know, whether I'm going to like a movie or not, but today, of course, we use machine learning in extremely sensitive applications. We use it in self-driving car to for medical diagnosis and things that have enormous consequences on people's lives. And so the question that we now have to ask is, you know, the cost of being wrong these days is extremely high because we deploy these algorithms in very sensitive applications. And so we need to think about whether we can have confidence in these predictions. And so um, this is an important topic because you know, another topic, which is all the rage at the moment within machine learning is of course deep learning. And I think it's been widely reported um, all the time. We see new papers showing us that you know, deep learning may not be this well calibrated. And so for validation purposes, what I'm about to deploy deep learning in application that requires extreme care, like say whether someone is gonna get a loan or not, someone who is gonna get paroled or not, uh, I cannot really assume that these models are well calibrated and we need to start to pay attention to this. So uh, at the end of the lecture, I will try to explain how our work fits in the broader area of um, uh, fairness and trying to fight biases in predictions that uh, systems make. And so this is another important aspect of what we're trying to address today. So um, to get us started, um, oops, uh, this lecture will be as a very simple theme to some extent, is we wanna understand how much we've really learned from past data. If the goal of data collection is to make predictions about the future, can I quantify the uncertainty I have about the predictions I'm making? And can I quantify it in a, in a rigorous and scientific way? How do I communicate my predictions, what I've learned from past data without hurting people, without discriminating against uh, people? And, you know, science is about counterfactuals and, you know, we're gonna try to answer the questions about how much we know about counterfactuals. And I'm very aware that I'm coming to a high place of causal inference. You guys had visionaries in the field. 
And so I feel like uh, it's a bit humbling for me to talk about counterfactual inference at Harvard. Okay, so what we want to do, is, what I'm going to try to do in this lecture is, you know, if, as I said, the goal of data collection and data analysis and machine learning is to make predictions, how do I convey uncertainty about my predictions? So, you know, I have a little cartoon picture here where we might assume that there is a place like Stanford University and you know, last year, I think 80,000 students applied for admission to Stanford. And it's possible that at some point we're going to outsource some of the, um, some of these to a machine learning algorithm. And, you know, a, a question would be, you know, applicants come with their features and the system will try to learn or try to predict how well they'll do if admitted to Stanford. And so if I have a system that spits a prediction, let's say 3.62, let's say that the predicted GPA based on a candidate's attributes after two years of college at Stanford, how am I, what I'm supposed to do with this? What is a decision maker supposed to do with this? And so what we're gonna to try to argue in this lecture is what I would like to do per, to see personally is to see prediction intervals more often. Right, so prediction intervals, I'm a statistician, are not confidence intervals. They are about future observations, not about parameters I, I make up. What I want to know is that why is it that in machine learning, we do not see prediction intervals more often? And by a prediction interval, and I'm going to formalize this a bit later, but you know, first intuitively, a prediction interval is a, is a range of predicted labels, a, a range of predicted values, that contains a true label 90% of the time or 95% of the time or 99% of the time you choose. But basically, instead of returning a point prediction, I want to return a range of labels. You know, If this is a, a continuous variable, perhaps an interval, otherwise a set of discrete labels that contains, that is with a prescription that it must contain the true label 90% of the time. And so, what I really want to know is because I'm prescriptive about the fraction of time the prediction interval has to contain the true label, I can really now start talking about what I've really learned from, the, from, the, from past data, as my colleague Brad Efron would say, from the experience of others, you know, because if I'm prescriptive about the coverage, let's say 90%, and the interval is wide, well, I've not learned that much, and I should be honest about it. Okay. So... In machine learning, we do not see predictive intervals very often. And the reason is we use very sophisticated algorithm you know, for practical purposes. We can think of them as black boxes. And it's very hard to understand how we should calibrate these things. You know, we're way past simple regressions. We don't have formulas for writing uh, prediction intervals. And so perhaps that's why we don't see them. But what we'll see in this lecture is that it is possible to develop prediction intervals around any black box, no matter how complex. And what I would like to get out of this lecture is that we should use this technology more often. Okay, so the, the surprise, if you've never heard about conformal uh, inference or conformal uh, prediction, is that when I have a machine learning algorithm that makes prediction, I can sort of build a wrapper or a protection layer around my machine learning algorithm to make it not give me a point prediction, but a range of value that will contain the true label, whatever fraction of the time you like. And I'm going to explain this by introducing a, a, a new algorithm that we call conformalized quantile regression. And this is joint work with uh, my former postdoc, Yaniv Romano, who is at the Ternian now, and Evan Patterson, who is at Berkeley. So again, just to make sure that we know what we're talking about, we're going to assume, as in most machine learning applications, that I have some training samples. Xs are my features, and the Ys are my labels, the thing that I'm trying to predict. And you give me a test point that you give me. I've seen st students. I've seen how well they do. And now you give me a new student with these or her features, like the school she went to, her GPA, her ACT scores, her extracurricular activities, and so on. And I need to predict the label that is, for example, how well she's going to do at Harvard. 
And so the goal that we're going to set for ourselves in this lecture is to construct again a predictive interval, a range of values that contains a true response, which I do not see, which I'm going to call yn plus one here, one minus alpha fraction of the time. And the crazy requirement we're going to make is we want this to hold no matter the underlying distribution, no matter the data generating mechanism, no matter the sample size, no matter the dimensionality, and so on and so forth. And just to repeat myself, you say, well, but that I can't do this if I don't have a model, but we'll see that we can, we can do this and we can do this quite well. Okay, so just to introduce the conformalized quantile regression algorithm or CQR for short, it might be good to think that machine learning has been solved. And what do I mean by machine learning has been solved? It means that I have data, Y, X and Y, and somehow um, I have an oracle who gives me the, distribu the joint distribution of X and Y. So that's what I mean by machine learning has been solved. I know the generating mechanism. There's nothing for us to do. And so if that's the case, then what, how would I actually make future predictions? That's very simple. Because I know the distribution of Y given X for every value of X, I would have the conditional distribution of Y given X. I could calculate the quantiles of this distribution for every value of X. I would connect the quantiles and I would get a predicted range. And then when somebody comes with an X equal to four, I would, my prediction interval would be exactly the, the, the range between the two quantiles. What's interesting on this picture is that we can see that the length of the interval can vary greatly depending on where you are in X space. And we would all agree that because I, machine learning has been solved then I would have validity on future samples. There's no question about that. But as you can imagine, well, machine learning has not been solved. I don't know what is a distribution of Y given X. All I have is this. And I'm trying to say, that's what you learn. That's, you know, we spend time and money collecting this data and it's in front of you. And now I want to, based on this data alone, I want to build prediction bands that will have 90% coverage on unseen samples. So how are we gonna do that? Okay. And what I'm proposing here, so what this new algorithm does, it's actually gonna to try to combine two wonderful ideas. The first is an idea that goes back 40 years uh, by Roger Conker and Gilbert Bassett, which is about regression quantiles. And the second is about conformal inference, which I'll explain later, is due to essentially Vladimir Volk and some of his collaborators. Let me uh, explain to you how um, a predictive algorithm, a, 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 a predictive algorithm might work. So let's say we like neural nets, why not? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just ask you to run your neural network, um, not with the, squared loss, that is, I'm not interested in actually predicting the conditional mean of y given x, but I'm gonna run, I'm asking you to run the neural network with what we call the pinball loss. And the pinball loss is something that looks like the um, absolute value function. And so you see it represented it on the right. And so it's a very simple loss. Um, if alpha is 0.5, this loss is simply the absolute value. So it's measuring the distance, the absolute distance between your label Y and your prediction F. And if alpha is not 0.5, then the pinball loss will be tilted. Uh, the, the, abs the absolute value function will be tilted on the left, on the right. And I'm not gonna to try to explain this mathematically, but what this is trying to do is it's gonna to try to estimate the quantiles. So by basically choosing alpha to, see, to say be 0.05, then what the objective, what the loss function is trying to do is trying to fit the fifth percentile of the conditional distribution of Y given X. And by choosing alpha to be 95%, it's gonna to try to fit the 95th percentile. And so you have your neural net and you just, all I'm asking you is to change the loss so that it's this pinball loss now. And then you're gonna get two curves. A curve you believe is the fifth percentile, a curve you believe is the 95th percentile. 
And my question is, is this gonna work? That is, can you go ahead and do Stanford admissions with these quantiles? And the answer is obviously you can't. And you know, it's not hard for you to see or at least get a sense of why you cannot. This will be poorly calibrated in general. In particular, if we use over-parameterized neural nets, it could very even be the case that both quantiles are the same because I interpolate the data exactly. Here in this example, I try to be less aggressive than that, but I still train a neural net. And I could see that, as I mentioned earlier, the neural net is just a bit too sure about itself. And so it returns two quantized functions, which are what you see, these two black curves. But when I test it on unseen data, I can see that my estimate of uncertainty is way too low. I'm far too confident about my predictions. There's much more uncertainty in the world than I pretend there to be. And in fact, here on this example, I achieved only 66% coverage on unseen data rather than 90%. So that doesn't work. And so we're gonna not need to fix this. And now I'm gonna show you how you fix this. One way to fix this is um, by going back to your sample, your, your, your data set. And for, for simplicity, I'm gonna split it into two parts. One part I'm gonna call the proper training set and another one which I'm gonna to use to calibrate what I'm learning from the training set. So on the first part, I'm gonna fit my quantiles, but we know that they're not gonna work very well, but I'm gonna to try to fit my quantiles to the best of my ability. And this is what I get. On the calibration set, I'm gonna to try to evaluate the quality of my quantile regression. And so the way we're gonna do this is, well, I'm gonna take the points in my calibration set. Let's say I have 300 of them and I'm gonna score them. And the scoring system we're gonna use is very simple and I can even say it in words, is I'm gonna take a calibration point, one of these 300 green points, and I'm gonna measure its distance to the nearest quantile function. So if I look at this point, uh, Lucas, can you see my mouse or you cannot? Yep, I can see it. Okay, so we look at this blue point that I'm, I'm trying to point here with my mouse. Um, I'm looking at its distance to the nearest quantile. Uh, th is this point, this nearest quantile is this one. And so I'm just gonna record how far they are from the nearest quantile. And I'm gonna say that the distance is positive if I'm outside of the predicted range and is negative else otherwise. So basically I'm, I'm taking a calibration point and say, are you inside? If you're inside, you're gonna be negative. If you're outside, you're gonna be positive. And the magnitude is simply the distance to the nearest quantile. Okay, so that's simple enough. And so, okay, so this is what you see at the top. You know, it's just in math, what I've just said. It's a signed distance to the nearest quantile, the vertical distance. And so I have 300 scores, and therefore I can draw a histogram of these scores. And let's say that we are interested in building up a 90% predictive interval for the response Y. So if that's the case, I'm gonna look at all these scores. I have 300 scores, and I'm gonna look at the 90th percentile of these scores. And so that's gonna be the 270th largest entry of my scores. And that's a number I'm gonna call Q. And now the procedure is very simple. All I'm doing is I'm going to shift the quantiles that I've run during training up and down by Q. All right. And so my recipe now for constructing the prediction band is to shift um, the lower and upper quantile by Q. Now, there are other ways of shifting them, there are more sophisticated ways than shifting them, but because Again, the goal of this lecture is to expose you to a range of topics. I'm not gonna look at every possible way. We can shift the quantiles, but this is one way, perhaps the most, the simplest way. And that's my proposed prediction interval. Okay, um, 
So what I want to observe at the moment is something which is sort of intuitive, which is that, well, suppose I did a fantastic job at learning the quantize, perhaps because I had a lot of data, perhaps because I have lots of insight. And so suppose that this fitted quantile were actually very close to the true quantiles. Then by definition, you know, 90% of the points would lie inside the prediction band because I'm using the right quantiles and 10% would, would lie outside. In this case, of course, the 90th percentile of my conformity score would be about zero. And then I would learn that I don't need to shift them. So, you know, I did a fantastic job on the calibration set, I did it. Look, Emmanuel, you did fantastic. You did what you needed to do. And so please don't touch it. On the other hand, if I'm using a neural net and I'm too aggressive, the neural net is too sure, like as we've seen before, then inside I would have 66% of the point. Outside I would have 33, 34% of the points. And therefore Q would be quite positive here. And what this would do is would enlarge the prediction band. If you were trained like me in classical statistics and you've become perhaps conservative and I would say perhaps even too conservative, then uh, you, know, you might actually overcover. And then in which case this method is quite unique because it will say, Emmanuel, you've been too conservative. You can actually shrink your intervals and still be well calibrated. Okay, so when you try a method like this on, on real data, uh, what you have is that um, you uh, do very well. And so now the quantiles have been shifted a bit by the, using the methodology we've just seen. And so on the future test sample, which is the same as what you've seen before, the coverage is not actually too good to be true. It's like you want 90 and you get 90. And maybe I got lucky, but no, we did not get lucky because there is actually a mathematical statement which would show you that what I'm just presenting is actually correct. Uh, it exactly has the validity you're looking for. And so uh, an interval constructed in this fashion would contain the true label uh, a given fraction of the time. And so, um, the coverage is at least one minus alpha, which is what you want, and at most essentially one minus alpha. And so these holes, you see, when I presented my methodology, I made no assumption whatsoever. Right? So no distribution, no assumption, doesn't matter what the sample size is. Even if I use bad quantile estimate, the method works. And so um, there are no assumption uh, anywhere except for the fact that future test points look like the training I have, the training samples I have, which is the idea, you know, maybe a simple, a simple version of this is to assume that the data is IID, a relaxed version is to say that the samples are exchangeable. Okay, so this is, I said I merged two ideas. One of course is the idea of quantile regression. The other is from conformal prediction. Uh, it's really a wonderful field of research, conformal prediction, which was started by computer scientists. And here's a, one of the first papers on this subject. Uh, this subject was largely developed by Vladimir Vovt, um, uh, whom you see pictured on the, on the left. And I, I have to say that his work has influenced mine uh, in a very profound way. I also want to single out uh, Jing Lei and Larry Wasserman from CMU, who uh, popularized or basically uh, first made groundbreaking contributions on their own in this field of research, but also uh, introduced it into the field of statistics. And that's how I came in contact with this. And so I just want to thank all three uh, because um, as I said, uh, all three have had a very profound influence on, 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 on our work at Stanford for the last two, three years. Emmanuel, okay. we have a we have a question in the chat. Oh yeah, so let, let me uh, yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so maybe I'll just I'll read it out. Um, does this mean that the data farthest from the bands gets filtered out and the system renormalized? From Charles Fidel. The it means that uh, does it mean that the, the 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 data point farthest from the band? They, not not necessarily, right? They, you know, this would be. You see my mouse. 
the, the farther from the band they're going to be over there, right? Or over or over here. They could be deep inside or deep outside. If they're over here, they're not going to be renormalized. I'm going to just learn how well is my calibration, how well is my quantile, my predicted range doing. And if I detect that it's under covering, I'm going to try to enlarge it up to the point where it covers. But I'm not renormalizing anything. Did I answer the question? Maybe not. So, okay. There's, there's one more question um, sure. while, we, while we have you. If you said yes, you answered his question, so that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is, is there any intuition for why this is independent of the quantile regression estimate? Suppose my quantile regression estimate was really, really bad, so as to be completely useless in the extreme case, then why should this work? Okay. All right, so it's a very good question. Uh, it, it, and I, I'm very glad you asked this because that's a question everybody should ask. So suppose I, I don't even try to learn the quantiles. Suppose I say lower x equals upper x equals zero. Then what this method, what does this method do? Then I think it's, I think, um, I think people need to think about this. So suppose I don't, I don't even try to learn. Then what happens is that um, my con confidence prediction, you know, lower is zero, upper is zero. And so what my con confidence band will be, they will be just the quantiles that I observe on the calibration set. And so they will be the quantiles of Y on the calibration set. That's what they will be. And marginally, I'm gonna be okay. That is, if I report the quantiles of calibrated points as my prediction band, now I'm gonna have a constant prediction band it's way too wide because I've not tried to learn anything. It's way too wide, but it's valid. So what I would achieve, and maybe that's a weakness of conformal prediction. I'm very glad people ask this. What I would achieve is I would achieve exactly what I claim I would achieve. And that's a, I would say that, yes, you have built a constant calibration, a, a, a constant prediction band that contains true label 90% of the time but it might not be very useful because it might be very wide. The two things that might not be very useful. One is might be very wide. Two is condition on X, you may be very far from achieving coverage. And I'm sorry if I sound too much like a statistician at the moment. I know it's, not, I know it's not a statistics talk. There's one more question, but I think we should, we should keep going and maybe that can be. Okay, so maybe I can answer a question in the end, yeah. Okay, so um, what they actually proposed is maybe I don't really have time to look at the algorithm they had proposed to implement this idea of conformal prediction. I will say the big problem I have with this is that to implement conformal prediction, they basically try to estimate the conditional mean by you know, minimizing the squared loss and then trying to understand what the size of the residuals are. And my issue with this is there are many issues with this. If you want to learn the quantiles of a distribution, why do you estimate the mean? I just don't, I mean, really, I don't get it. And second, if you look at the algorithm, it produces intervals of constant widths, which is really suboptimal. So let me just explain this on my, on my, on my next slide. So here we have a, a data set and we have two ways of building uh, uh, conformal band, uh, uh, prediction band. They are both valid marginally, as we've seen, but you can see that qualitatively they look very different. On the left, you have what people were doing up to now. You know, the we have um, uh, a, an interval of constant widths that is just being shifted around. And on the right, we have CQR. We can see that the length of the interval depends enormously on when you are in X space. So. In the CQR world, uh, we see a lot of benefits. We seem to be adaptive to the distribution of the data while well, it's questionable on the left. And the benefit of being adaptive is now I can give you prediction bands that are narrower. So if I look at the average length of the CQR interval, it's gonna be 2.18 versus 2.91 for the traditional method. Of course, both methods achieve coverage, uh, but one seems to do two things. First, it's, it, it, it is more adaptive. And second, it has shorter intervals on average. Now I wanna come back to what I just said a minute ago. 
So this is a point I was trying to make. This is the length of the CQR interval as a function of X. And we can see that most of the time it's below um, what's been offered by the traditional method. But the second point I want to make is here, which is that the weakness, and this is honestly for people interested in this field of research, you know, the weakness of conformal prediction is that you can only guarantee marginal coverage. You cannot guarantee conditional coverage. You cannot say for people with this X, these are my predictions. It's not possible. But you would like to aim at conditional coverage. And what we see on this figure is as a function of X, I'm plotting the coverage as a function of X. The blue curve is CQR, and we see it's almost flat at 90%, which is exactly what you want. Whereas the traditional methods is actually having wide oscillation around the nominal coverage because sometimes, because intervals are too big, are of fixed size, sometimes they are too wide, sometimes they are too big. On average, they're okay, but at any given value of X, they might be either too big or too small. And so that's what we'd like to think that, you know, CQR is, is largely the right thing to do. Okay. Now, since then, there's been a lot of work on trying to, to make things even better. I would like to work, single out the work of your neighbor, Viktor Chernozukhov, uh, who has a wonderful paper about how perhaps even improve on the CQR algorithm. There are many things I'm not discussing. I've focused on continuous variables, but we have extensions to discrete labels. Uh, this was published in Europe last year. And, um, and so there's many things I'm not telling you. Okay, so when you apply this, you can apply this to almost any data set you like, provided that the exchangeability assumption holds. And um, um, here is a data set of um, medical expenditure, uh, where the goal is to predict the healthcare system utilization as measured by the number of visits to a doctor's office or a hospital. And we have lots of covariates. We have age, we have marital status, we have race, we have poverty status, we have functional limitations and so on, the kind of insurance you have, and we want to achieve coverage. And so I want to make predictions that I can trust. And so, you know, these are the CQR algorithm, and this is very boring because it's a theorem that the coverage is 90%, and that's what you see again and again and again. And this is a method of Wolft, and, you know, it also achieves marginal coverage. But when we look at measures of conditional coverage, we can see that CQR is far more accurate than the other methods. And also it's far more adaptive, which you can see that the length of the CQR interval on real data tends to be much shorter than those of competing algorithms. And so it, this is a method that when you deploy it, when you have exchangeability, it works well. And, um, and, uh, and yeah. Okay, and so we apply this to lots of data sets of all different walks of life, Facebook data, where we want to predict whether a, tweet, uh, a post will be popular or not, a tweet will be retweeted or not. You know, we always get this boring plot, which is the coverage is 90%, but we often see that the secure algorithm is more adaptive and tend to return shorter intervals. So it's, it seems to be a good thing to do. Okay, Lucas, I'm about to transition, but... Um, Maybe instead of talking about counterfactual inference, uh, maybe I should just skip ahead and talk about something which is a bit more recent. And uh, okay. we can talk about counterfactual inference, which is uh, very important. Uh, but just to give you a sense of, of this method, um, this CQR algorithm was actually used in a modified way uh, by the Washington Post during election week. And I would like to say a few words about this because um, I think it's quite important and also it inspired a lot of further research. So this is not my work anymore. This is the work of John Chirian, who is a PhD student at Stanford and of Lenny Bronner, who is a data scientist at the Washington Post um, desk. And so the, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, you know, we had a 2016 uh, presidential uh, election and these are the results of 2016, and so the red, you know, I don't think I need to explain this map. I think everybody can see what this is, and this is Hillary Clinton 
and Donald Trump, and we see the fraction of voters in each county voting for one of these two. Okay. And um, what the Washington Post uh, wanted to do is they wanted to uh, use uh, covariates, demographic characteristics, to predict the outcome of the 2020 election. Now, I need to be very clear about what that means. We're on election day and all ballots have been cast, but I can't see them all. I can only see the, the information we have at any given time are what's been reported. So counties have reported and other counties have not reported. And the goal of the Washington Post was to predict what we will see at the end when everything will have been re reported. So we need to predict the number of votes for Hillary or for Joe Biden in County I, given that I has not been reported yet. And so what we want, what the Washington Post wanted to do is to use demographic characteristic to predict not exactly the votes. Well, of course, it's going to, in the end, it's going to give you a, a number for the votes for Joe Biden, but they had an outcome that they wanted to predict, which is a vote for Joe Biden in 2020 minus the vote for Hillary in 2016 over the number of votes for Hillary 2016. And they wanted to predict this county by county using XIs, which are characteristics of county number I. And of course here, if during election night, I was actually able, if, if, you know, if counties were reporting in the sense that they're all in an urn and I just draw them at random, then the data will be exchangeable, not IID, but it will be exchangeable and everything you've seen would apply as is. I would be able to build prediction intervals for each county that would have 90% coverage on a marginally. The problem, as you know, is that counties are not reporting at random. Rural counties tend to report earlier. Uh, Eastern counties tend to report earlier. And so it's not that we're just drawing counties from an urn uh, as election night progresses or even the week progresses is you know, there is what we're gonna call a distribution shifts. Some counties by virtue of their features where they're geographically located by virtue of their population size and so on will report earlier and others will report later. And so the method we've seen are not directly applicable. So the data is not exchangeable. And in a way what the subtle work of John Chirian and Lainey Bronner has been about is to use this part of the talk I just skipped, but trying to match the distribution of covariates in unseen countries with what's been reported and do some form of uh, important sampling to, to match unreported counties with reported counties and use CQR on top of this. And of course, um, uh, they've done this. And one of the things that they could do at the Washington Post is one they had a formula for upweighting certain, certain counties um, and downweighting others, um, they could actually see whether their method worked by basically playing the election night, you know, for the previous election, instead of going from 2016 to 2020, we could go from 2012 to 2016 and from 28 to 2012. And so before they went live, they were making sure that, you know, their ways of adapting to distribution shifts um, would act, when you played back to the movie on previous election would actually work and they convinced themselves that it worked. And so they went live. And uh, what you could see on the Washington Post website were predictions for uh, at the state level and for how the uh, election would come out. And, um, and so I really think they did a fantastic job because they were trying to through some data visualization, trying to tell their readers what they actually knew about the outcome of the election. And so this is a snapshot of their website, uh, which was taken on November 5th at 12.50 a.m. Um, <clears throat> Eastern time. And so what they had is, we you know, we're in the state of Pennsylvania. By that time, of course, uh, 
in terms of counted votes, Trump was far ahead. But, you know, the Washington Post was predicting that Biden would likely come ahead. And, you know, the color schemes are basically the quantiles of the distribution. So, you know, if it's dark color, it's where they think the medium of the prediction interval is and light is like, you know, the percentile. And they were right in this case and they did not make mistakes. But I think the point is not that they were right or wrong. It's of course an application where the stakes are very high. The cost of being wrong is high. And they were very careful in communicating what they knew about the election by basically doing, introducing their readers to a lot of uncertainty quantification and, and using predictive intervals to actually tell their readers what they knew. And I think they really have to be commended for this. Okay, so they had a certain way to deal with a, a certain method to deal with the fact that uh, there were shifts as the election night progresses. And I think that's a hot topic in machine learning at the moment that, you know, do I have the right to assume that, you know, I'm a company, I'm gonna deploy a predictive algorithm. Do I have the right to think that the future looks like the past? Every machine learning paper assumes so, almost every machine learning paper assumes so, but is that a realistic assumption? In reality, things are gonna shift. And so what should we do with this? So I wanna present a, a, a very recent work, which is joint work with a, a, a recent graduate student, Isaac Gibbs, uh, on this very issue. So we were to think, we started to think about conformal prediction in, in the context of online learning, where now we really think about our data as a data stream, X, T, Y, T, and we have no reason to believe that the future looks like the past. So we think that X, T, Y, T follows a distribution P, T that changes across time. Of course, this is not known to us. We don't know P, T, otherwise the problem is solved. And at time T, just like in election night, we want to use the observed counties, the reported counties to predict the, the outcome of the next county reporting. And so we want to form a prediction set, which has sort of the validities we've talked about before. And what there is when you, you know, what makes conformal prediction work is that there is no distinction between the training sample and the test set because data points are sampled from the same distribution. So when I look at my calibration set and I compare it with a distribution of the future test point, it, it's the same, right? So I've got a, an honest sample of future test points. And so I can learn what will happen in the future by just looking at my calibration set. And so what I mean by that is by achieving one minus alpha coverage on the calibration set, I will essentially achieve one minus alpha coverage on future test samples. But when the distribution is shifting, that's no longer the case. And so when the distribution is shifting, you know, maybe the distribution tomorrow is not exactly the same as the one today. And so to achieve one minus alpha coverage on future test samples that are a bit different from the samples I've seen up to now, then what I would like to say that, you know, there's this knob that we can play with. And what I'm trying to argue here is that there is a quantile of the calibrated district of the distribution I'm getting to see on the calibrated set that will achieve one min minus alpha coverage in the future for that at that time point. I don't know what it is, of course, but there is, you know, what I'm trying to say that, yeah, I should not use a 90th percentile of the calibration scores. Maybe I should use a 95th percentile because you know, maybe the thing is becoming more uncertain. Or maybe I could use the 85th percentile because things are becoming more certain. But whatever the situation is, there is a quantile of the conformity scores I've seen so far. And if I had an oracle that would tell me, Emmanuel, don't use the 90th percentile because things are, have changed a bit. If you were to use the 92th percentile, you're going to be good. Or maybe you should use the 86th percentile. Or maybe you should use the 77th percentile. There is a, a level that if I had an oracle who knows about the distribution shift could tell me, look, Emmanuel, turn your knob this way. And I can tell you that we're gonna choose one minus alpha coverage tomorrow. And of course, sometimes we'll turn the knob to the right. 
Sometimes it will turn the knob to the left. But if I had an oracle like this, I could maintain coverage even under distribution shifts. And so, of course, like, well, who is going to tell me how to turn the knob? Nobody, right? So if I had oracle knowledge, you know, I would know how to turn the knob to achieve precise coverage tomorrow. Um, and the core of key idea we had with Isaac is, uh, well, nobody's giving us this knob, telling us how to turn the knob. Can we use learning itself to learn how to turn the knob? And so, all right, so this is kind of a, a, a little bit of a crazy proposal we had was to say, well, as an alternative to what John Sherian and Lainey Bronner had been doing, how about we fit the knob, we learn how to turn the knob by in sort of an online way. And so we thought, okay, we're gonna to try to learn alpha T, how to turn the knob by monitoring the error we make as we go along. And Daniel, so, there's, a, there's a question in the chat, if I can just yeah. interrupt you. Um, it says, there is no allowing for autocorrelation in the data generating process PT over time. Instead, PT minus one is assumed to be independent of PT. That seems like throwing away some predictive power when we can infer that PT minus one is in some sense similar to PT, even if we want to be robust to them not being equal. That, okay, that's a good point. Um, I'm, at the moment, I'm assuming that I have, um, I have independent, so the samples are independent, but they come from a distribution that can vary with time. Now, that's the only, you know, our theory assumed that. But if you think that more is true, you can try to learn from the past. You know, you can try to exploit in the way you're gonna construct your conformity scores. You can try to use everything you'd like to use. Um, but yeah, at the moment I'm gonna say, you know, the, that's, that's the assumption I'm gonna make. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have an error process and each time a county is being reported and I'm gonna use my analogy with, with the Washington Post election and I make an error and, you know, I make an error. I say the error process is one. If I'm, I failed to cover my prediction interval for this county did not, was incorrect and zero otherwise. So this is my error process. And I'm gonna to try to calibrate the next prediction by monitoring how well I'm doing. Okay, and I have a simple sort of, you can think of this as sort of, sort of a gradient update for the knob. Well, I'm gonna say next time I'm gonna use alpha T plus gamma, alpha is a target, the error is the one I'm getting to see. And so this is how I'm gonna turn the knob dynamically, all right? I'm gonna turn the knob and if I see that I make too many errors, then this quantity will become negative. I'm gonna say use a lower value of alpha, or in other words, use a higher nominal coverage level. And if I'm being too conservative, it will say, you know, decrease it. Now, I don't have much time left, so, I want to say that this is, we have, we can connect this with online learning. I can explain how this update for turning the knob is a form of online gradient descent on some funny looking objectives. I can connect this with a control theory. It's a form of P controller if, for those of you who know about uh, control theory, but whatever the connection we can draw, this is a simple update that I, I want to propose. Okay. And now um, this is, you know, of course we know nothing about how counties report. And what I'm looking at now is I'm just using this update for alpha to actually predict county, make county level predictions. And in this example, the uh, counties are reporting from east to west. So we order the counties according to geographic location and the most Eastern county reported first the most Western county reported last, and then we traverse the United States from east to west. And what you see in red is the thing that John and Lenny were worried about, which is that if you use, uh, if you use prediction intervals, you're not trying to adapt for the distribution shift. Uh, you get this curve in red, which kind of, you know, there are times at which you're really far from what, where you want to be. But if we look at this sort of dynamic procedure where we're trying to learn how to turn the knob, then we can see that you know, we really have as 
throughout through 2,500 counties, when we look at the local coverage, we you know the target again is 90%. So first of all, we achieve 90% marginally, whereas not fixing alpha is not achieving exactly 90%. And then we can see that, yes, of course, because things are random, we're gonna swing around the 90% line. But as you can see, and it's, I find this pretty remarkable, that the excursions are not very large. And so the process we're actually drawing look very much like an average of IID Bernoulli's with probability of success 0.9. Okay, so it seems to work quite well. Of course, the theory, we develop a bit of theories that I will not, to present, that I will not present. And, um, and uh, you know, you can apply this to the stock market. If your boss asks you to predict volatility tomorrow, what are you gonna do? So that you're 90% correct of the time. And as we know, the stock market is not something that is stationary. 2020 does not look like 2019. And it really does not look like 2019. And so we were looking at stock prices and here, like, let's look at two, uh, you know, extreme ones, Blackberry and Fannie Mae. The goal is to predict the volatility of their returns over time. And we can see that if we're not trying to be adaptive to distributional shifts, I'm gonna get a local error, which looks like the, the red curve, which is gonna swing enormously around the target. But if I'm trying to be adaptive, uh, I'm gonna get the blue curve, which swings far less around the target, achieves sort of 90% coverage over a 20 year period. Uh, note that here we have huge periods of transition. You know, We have the 2008 crisis, we have the COVID crisis at the end, we have a lot of stuff going on, and yet through, through time, uh, we, man, we managed to maintain coverage. To show you a bit why we're excited about this, of course, we achieve the number, and on average, we can see that the coverage is what it needs to be, 90%. But also what are these kind of brown and green curves supposed to represent? They represent the kind of local errors we would get if you know, our errors were Bernoulli 0.9. And so what we can see that the blue curve looks very much like one of these curves, which is like really what we would get under the assumption that we're correct with probably 0.9 independently through time. And so, so it looks, so it's very reassuring. Okay, I have um, a, a few minutes left and maybe I will conclude with this. Um, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, this is another vignette and this, this is my last vignette. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning uh, equitable treatment. And so um, I want to say a few words about this because I think it's important. So as you know, we have to make sure as when we deploy machine algorithm up, machine learning algorithms that impact people's lives that we're not hurting groups of people. And there's been a lot of controversies lately about the use of machine learning algorithms to decide who gets paroled, who gets a loan and so on. And I'm sure you've seen many articles in the popular press about this. Um, and we need to be really mindful of this. You know, we need to design systems that are fair. Okay, so I think that one of the problem I personally see with machine learning and the way it looks at fairness is that I see, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll make this point later. So I think as a data scientist, um, it's very important for me to kind of, again, going back to the theme of this lecture, if I collect the data to make informed prediction, um, what uncertainty do I have to make uh, in, in my predictions? How do I not overstate uh, what can be inferred from the black box? And we've, of course, talked about this. But the thing is that we want to treat people equitably. And so the, the thing that I think I'm a bit puzzled with in the, with the machine learning algorithm is that a lot of the work I see published is trying to encode notions of fairness mathematically, right? So uh, a lot of the work on, on machine, on fairness in machine learning will start by, here's a mathematical definition of fairness. I'm gonna encode it mathematically and I'm gonna try to fit an algorithm that is respectful of this definition. Uh, definition of fairness. And I think that's a bit problematic for several reasons. 
one is I don't think we agree on what fairness is. So if we don't agree, and I read a bit about uh, what legal scholars have to say about fairness, and you know the U.S. courts actually disagree on what fairness means, and legal scholars disagree on what fairness means. And so if we disagree on what it is, how can we encode it mathematically? That's a part I'm not sure I understand. And the second is is even deeper is that it means it says like somehow what these people are trying to achieve is they're trying to, you know, is to, to set the algorithm as a decision maker. And an algorithm for me is not the decision maker. There are two issues and they should not be conflated. One is the risk assessment problem. And the second is a policy question. But the problem with the, the view of the world I have about machine learning is when Compass says, why equals one, this person will commit another crime, why equals zero? This person will not commit another crime. We're not doing, we're conflating the, the policy problem with the statistical problem. And what I would like to argue is I want to decouple the learning problem from the policy problem. And to quote from Corbett Davis and Goel, I could say that a machine algorithm can correctly predict that the chance of a person to commit another crime is 20%, but that does not determine a policy. This fact in and on itself does not determine a policy. So what I would like really to present is to, to show you a view of how we can use these tools actually to inform decision makers by not positioning the algorithm as a decision maker. And so I think in that view is somewhat against the current thinking in modern machine learning. And so you know, this is what I just said. There's a tendency these days to pose algorithms as decision makers to encode what fairness means and, and to, to go along with this. And the problem with this is I'm sure as many people have, have heard is that, you know, if two people have a different notion of fairness, then usually there is no algorithm that can obey both of them. That's impossible. So, so what are you supposed to do? And as I mentioned, there is work that shows that we don't even agree on what fairness is. So I think one of the way you can use the, the methods from this lecture is to say, well, I want to summarize, you know, my goal is to say, you want to make a prediction, but now you want to make a prediction that pe treat people equitably. Let's say I have male and female, and I want to learn to report what I've learned from data analysis in a way that is unbiased. I don't want to have a prediction interval that is accurate for male and totally inaccurate for female or accurate for whites and totally inaccurate for non-whites. And so now we're going to say, well, maybe you should aim a bit higher. And so you say, you want to make a prediction about an individual, whether this person is going to repay a loan or not, or um, you know, is going to do well at Stanford or not, and so on. And there are sensitive attributes you care about. And so perhaps what we could do is we could build prediction intervals that hold no matter what sensitive attributes you care about, you know, whether you're male or female, white or non-white, and so on and so forth. And so I think this is a very nice way of summarizing what we've learned from machine learning. I think by saying that now you just not need to be marginally correct, you need to be correct conditioned on things to care about, white versus non-white, male versus female, you are treating people equitably. And if your intervals are long, then you have to be honest, you know, I've learned little from past data about individuals or individuals in this category. And so we have to be honest. And I think that's one way we could communicate what we've learned from uh, statistical modeling um, that treats people equitably. And so the way you would do this is you might say, you know, People are people, after all, they're not that different. I'm gonna train a model both on male and female, but when I need to calibrate, you know, that's a, my green points, I'm gonna calibrate on separate groups. And Just heads up, this. Emmanuel, we're oh. right at two o'clock now, so okay. so I wanna wrap up too. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna wrap up, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop this. And there's a way of calibrating so that you're unbiased for, for the group, so that you achieve coverage conditioning on being male or female. And just to look back at my other example, and that's gonna be my last slide, you know, there was one attribute, which was race. And when we fitted a neural network to this medical service data set, 
we realized that the neural net overestimated the response of the non-white group and underestimated the response of the white groups. In a way, it was a bit biased against non uh, against non whites. But that's something that the algorithm actually detected and corrected. And so we could actually build prediction band that would be valid for each group, white versus non-whites. And what we can see is that, you know, it's in a way the algorithm says in this case that it's actually easier to predict uh, healthcare utilization for non-white than it is for white because the, the length is shorter than it is here. But what you're saying is you're telling decision makers, this is what I know about the problem. And if you try to imply that you know more, then you, you know, you're going to have to defend it somehow because I don't think that you know more than what, what you see here. Okay, so I took too much of your time. Um, we have lots of codes and, and papers that uh, people can look at if they're interested. Um, I want to, uh, to thank everyone for their hospitality and attention, and I'm sorry uh, to run a bit long. Thank you. No one else can clap audibly, but I can, so, uh, so I'll do it for everyone else. Um, yeah, so we have, you know, a little under 15 minutes for discussion, um, just since there's so many people on the call, uh, you know, people can, can type questions in or, or perhaps raise their hands. Um, ah, so, so Petrus just posted, so, so we'll post the slides on the IACS website, so you can, uh, you can find that. Um, so we had uh, one question I'll start with um, that uh, was from the online learning part of the talk with mm -hmm. Isaac Gibbs. Um, that I didn't get to. So this is, would a Bayesian process automatically learn the error simply by incorporating new data as it arrives, thereby eschewing the complexity of formal learning of alpha? A Bayesian method, you say? Bayesian process, yes. This is Charles Fidel. If you want to elaborate, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Yeah, I think if we could elaborate, that would help me. Because yes. I really don't know exactly how the future looks like, uh, and I, I, you know, so. Yes, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, well, in an Bayesian process, you're constantly adding new data points as you get new information, as you know. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm just wondering if one cannot start, uh, let's say, interpolate, extrapolating a trajectory, and then constantly correcting the trajectory with new data points, thereby learning on the fly. Uh, it might be possible. Uh, it's it might be so. If not explored the connection with Bayesian analysis, uh, it might be. I, I have to say, when we started this, we were more inspired by control, right? So control theory says you know you have an error process, and I would like this error process its average to be around 0.9 at any given time, right? And so then I have this knob to bring it down. You know, I have this actuator to this command to bring the error level down or to bring it up, depending on what I see, we're thinking really about this in terms of control, but it might be that there are other ways to think about it. So, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, that's a good, so if, if you look at the paper we have, we do analysis in the thing that is a bit Bayesian in nature, that is we do analysis in, in a, in a framework, which is a hidden Markov model. So we assume that, you know, we have time and we have some latent variables that we cannot see. And of course we have emission probabilities. And so this is supposed to model regime change, right? So, you know, we, the, the, the distribution can go through different regimes. You know, if in this model, um, Bayesian thinking can offer some insight that would be great. Merci, professor. Merci. All right, we have another question from uh, Pantelis Vlachas. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Is there something that prohibit, prohibits the use of the algorithm to introduce bias? I mean, it could be used in principle to cultivate the already existing biases slash enforce others with ethical issues arising. Yes. So when we care about biases, of course, if the data collect, so this is the thing that this cannot fix is if data is biased to start with, this will not fix it, right? So, you know, when we look at biases in machine learning, it can come from very different sources. And of course, a very important source of bias in machine learning is the data collection itself. It might be the fact that black, you know, 
to 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 when I want to predict whether someone is going to commit another crime, well, I, I need crime data. And what if black neighborhoods are over policed versus white neighborhoods? So this is typically a, a sort of bias at the very at the level of data collection that people are extremely worried about. This will not fix it. And so this is independent of this. This is assuming that we have uh, high quality data uh, that has been curated in some way. And so, for example, you know, one thing that we did when we actually started to look at these uh, prediction intervals is um, we looked at male and female. And so, you know, we want prediction for male to be accurate and prediction for females to be accurate. And we could see that, for example, for females, the intervals were, were wider. And one of the reasons is that we had just less data for female than we have for, for male. And so um, it's not, I mean, you know, this is what this analysis can reveal. It cannot correct biases in the data collection. What it can do is though, you can say, in the case of medical data, where the intervals for females are wider, you can say, look, the intervals for females are much wider than for male. Why is that so? And then you look at and you say, but I have far more males than female. So it can correct, it can suggest action, but we cannot correct biases at the data collection level. Great, so we have a hand raised, but I, uh, there was a question, one more question in the chat first from uh, Jatin Batra, it says, how tight is the result on the distribution shift via learning the alpha t's? Do we have a theorem there? Yeah, okay. So uh, I, 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 you know, my talk was more about vignettes. So yes, we have theorems and I can show them to you. But uh, we were lucky that our, the paper is online. And so online, uh, you'll see the theorems. And the a, a theorem is under no assumption whatsoever, the long-term coverage will be one minus alpha. No assumption of any kind. Uh, but then you might want to ask for more. And for that, it's going to be a bit hard to explain what the theorem says exactly. But it's going to try to quantify in a hidden Markov model the distance between the achieved coverage at any time point versus a target. And it's all in the paper, but it's a bit, it's a bit hard for me to explain. But yes, they are theorems. And we have a raised hand. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Grant, um, thank you. Um, first, thanks all for giving this talk. Uh, it was really good. It was really helpful in my thinking. Um, so forgive me if I'm taking a bit of a weird view on this because I'm in an economics department, so we're all a bit weird over here. Um, but from what you just said there about not addressing the like uh, data bias issue, like it seems to me that most of the most of the ML algorithms that we use kind of have this like training and testing error already. And that a huge problem with those errors and the entire process is that um, like these data are just susceptible, just as susceptible to the data bias as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I really enjoyed all of the paper, the presentation, like flecking through the paper on the side. Um, but like, if this method doesn't have anything to say about the like data bias issue, like what does it really add on top of using training and testing error rates um, then? I think what I'm trying to say is perhaps maybe my, my, my answer is going to be minimalist here, um, is to say I have data, let's say we want to automate part of an admission process to Stanford, right? I have data and I need to, and, and the admission officers, you know, they want to know whether people, it's, it's, it's legitimate. They would want to know, will students do well at Stanford? And, you know, there are metrics we can think of, you and I, about what that means, right? So this is an outcome that I can measure about current students. And I want to predict this outcome. And I, can I learn, like, can I learn the characteristic of a student that make them do well at Stanford, right? You agree with me? Okay. And the thing is, well, we've got a lot of data about past applicants. We, 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 we can try to learn what makes students do well at Stanford, right? And what I'm advocating here is if I want to use a deep network to sort of sort, sift through applications, you know, which is what, you know, 
some of the companies, and I think we had a lot of controversies about that, right? Amazon, you know, would actually use machine learning to rank CVs, right? And then, oh, all the male CVs are on top and all the female CVs are at the bottom, right? That's kind of the controversy we heard about. Suppose you use a system like this one instead, where I say, here's your applicant. This is how well I predict this person will do. And by the way, my, and by the way, I'm going to be honest, it's in the range. And so you should, when you make a decision, please take this into consideration because this is uncertainty I have about my prediction. And second, I can guarantee that this prediction is, is uh, unbiased. That is for all males and all females, you know, you know my prediction is correct 90% of the time, regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity. And that's what I'm saying. All I'm saying, and I wanna be minimalist here, is like, how about I report the results of data analysis in this way? instead. And so I cannot correct biases in data collection. That I can't do. I can't change the fact that, you know, some, some neighborhoods may have been over-policed that, you know, that I cannot do. And of course, it's a very important issue what you talk about. But once we agree on a data set, how do I communicate to a decision maker what I've learned? What is, you wanted me to train machine learning models on this. At the end of the day, please summarize your findings for me. And how do we do that? And what I'm saying is that to me, I sort of like this. You know, I, I, I like, um, I like the, the proposal because it says, first, I'm honest about you. you know, I, I'm honest. You know, this is an individual for which I don't know much. You know, I think you know, I live in the Silicon Valley and you know, we think we know the future, but we don't. You know, predicting whether a cow is an image or not is not the same as what Emmanuel will do next year. And yet, we're, there are some people who tend me to believe that they know everything about me, but they don't. And this will force some honesty. And thank honesty, you. That was, that was a fantastic <laughs> honesty, honesty that is unbiased, that is somehow, it, it is unacceptable if your predictions are valid for a group and unvalid and not valid for another one. There's so much variations in, in humans. And yet we pretend that, you know, I can see the future. It's not, because, it's not because you can find a cow in an image that you know what will happen to a person a year from now. Great, so other, other questions in the chat or, or people should feel free to raise their hands. In the meantime, we, we have about one minute left. So maybe I'll ask a, a quick question. Manual, because I like I really like this work with uh, with Isaac Gibbs, the online you know assumption okay. free. Uh, I was hesitating to present it, but I'm glad I did then. <laughs> oh no, this I think it's I think it's very cool, but it's very different. I think from from yeah. you know other types of results. Even it feels very different to me from conformal inference, and that uh, it's very different from conformal in, inference. In so way. I think the goal for us is how can we re re reconcile this with conformal inference because it's very different. Right. So I guess my question is: so you know your boss asks you to to predict. Uh, a range of values for the volatility of some stock or Washington mm -hmm. Post has to predict, you know, the, the range of some uh, election outcome. I think the thing with this approach is it can, it can output negative infinity, infinity. Right. And you know what, so is that what you would tell your boss? I think maybe your boss might not be happy with you. Sometimes it will do this, right? So that's why we need, what we need is what can we get, right? So you want, so I can do a good job by 10% of the time, giving you an interval of length zero and 90% of the time giving you mine. But of course, that's not what we want, right? And so I think I'm going to judge you by, first of all, over time, do you do a good job? And second, uh, what's the length of the interval? So what I like about conformal inference in the way of thinking is I can be prescriptive about what I want you to achieve over time. And so I want an algorithm to get 90 over time, over and now I can judge different, because now we have different conformity scores, right? Different update rules maybe, right? And now we can talk about performance and performance would be, you know, what's the average length of your interval? Now, one thing that I'm surprised that people have not asked me, for example, is how do you choose sort of this gamma parameter, what I think of as a step size, should be also learned, you know, how fast do you need to update? How aggressively do you want to turn this knob or not, right? And I think 
I don't have answers to any of this. I mean, we're researching this at the moment. And as Lucas, you say correctly, we're trying to bring this, this is very much like control at the moment and not enough like conformal prediction. And so we, we're trying to bridge this gap, you know, like, you know, if, how do I make it look more like conformal prediction? And how do I choose gamma, you know, and all that. Thanks very much, Emmanuel. Bye-bye.